Good morning. It is so good to have you here with us this last Sunday of October, October the 30th, 2022. And just by way of reminder, we're here at the First United Methodist Church of Interlochen. And thank you so much for tuning in, giving some of your valuable time to hear a message from the Word of God. Folks, just by way of reminder, Tuesday is November the 1st, and we have our new upper rooms available for you here at the church. So if you'd like to stop by the office or by the church and pick one up, feel free to. If you're long distance and you don't have access, just give us a phone call and we'd be happy to mail you one, a copy of the upper room. It's so important to have that daily quiet time with God. When you get alone with the Lord, spend time with him and read his word and pray and have your own personal relationship with God. It means, means so, so much. So let's open up in a word of prayer and then we will get started. Father, thank you for this fresh new day and thank you, Lord, for you, that you're not a piece of stone or an idol carved by wood, but that you're the living God who made heaven and earth, that we can pray to you and you hear us and answer our prayers, that you're an ever-present help of time, of trouble, and that, Lord, we can trust and depend upon you to give us guidance and show us the way. Thank you, God, for being so real. We believe in you, we trust you, and we look to you today. Father, I pray you would fill me with the Holy Spirit. You would fill everyone listening with the Holy Spirit. And I pray we would be able to understand the spiritual truth you have for us today. Father, we look to you and look away from ourselves. In Christ's name, amen. Folks, today I'm going to be speaking from a very familiar passage of Scripture, Psalm 23. So if you'd like to turn there in your Bible to Psalm 23, that's where we'll be looking at today. You know, it's interesting, Psalm 23 and the Lord's Prayer as recorded in the New Testament are probably the two most favorite passages of Scripture and most well-known. And I found often that uh, the Lord's Supper and especially and here in Psalm 23 is read during the time of funerals. And when people are reading that scripture, they, they're so grieving and so hurt by what has happened that they really don't absorb much from Psalm 23. So I want us to take a look at it today. You know, as I was preparing earlier this week, I couldn't help but think about visiting my grandmother when I was a young boy in Virginia. She had a farm in Middlebrook, Virginia, outside of the Stanton, Virginia area in the western part of the state. And I remember one time when we were visiting on my grandmother's farm that my grandmother told my mom if she would go pick some wild blackberries that Mamma would bake a homemade blackberry pie for mom and us kids. And that sounded good to me, so mom took my sister, who was a few years older, and myself, and we walked up through the pasture to go into the woods to pick some wild blackberries. Well, on our way, we noticed that there was a sheep that had gotten stuck in the barbed wire there in the fence. It was kind of a younger sheep. It wasn't a lamb. It was bigger than a lamb, but it was stuck there in the barbed wire. So before we went to pick the blackberries, Mama told us kids to stay back at a distance so we'd be safe. And Mama went up and put one foot on the bottom strand of the barbed wire, picked up the middle strand of the barbed wire, and kind of motioned the sheep with her foot the sheep was able to free itself and get out from being entangled in the barbed wire. And then the sheep ran over with the herd of other sheep that were over there grazing and went back to be with the flock. And I can remember Mama getting that sheep uncaught from the barbed wire, and I thought that was so cool. We went on to pick some blackberries and everything. We took them back, and Mamma made a beautiful blackberry pie. We had it with homemade vanilla ice cream, and it was so good. I remember my grandfather raising sheep there on the farm. And as I think about that in Psalm 23, it's interesting. David started out his life as a shepherd. God trained him to be a shepherd, watching over sheep before he was ever anointed to become the king of Israel and watch over people as a shepherd king. And David, underneath the inspiration of the Holy Scripture, Remember, it tells us in the New Testament that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Literally, all Scripture is God-breathed. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Scripture, penned Psalm 23. 
So I want to take a look at this Psalm of David and look at it closely this morning as we look at the Word of God. I'll be teaching from the New International Version. You might have something that's a little different, but the thoughts will basically be the same. David starts out and he says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. If you notice in your Bible, the word Lord is all capitals. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's basically the translation of God's proper name, Yahweh. When the Germans translate it, they put, they put the word Jehovah. But Yahweh is what we understand to be the original. Yahweh, a personal God, is my shepherd. David knew that just as he watched out over sheep, that God was the shepherd that was watching out over him. And notice his first declaration, I shall not be in want. Folks, God takes care of all of our needs. God knows what we need, and we're going to have exactly what we need. We might not always get what we want, but if we are honest, God gives us exactly what we need. I shall not be in want. Verse 2 says, He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. You know, sheep have to eat. And if you and I think about it, we need to eat also. And God provides our daily food and takes care of us, just like a shepherd would lead a sheep and lead his flock into green pastures. Now, when you and I think about green pastures, like I think about the lush countryside and the mountain hills of Virginia, you might think of where you grow up within the summer with fresh green grass. But over in the Holy Land, where David was a shepherd, and even to this day where there are shepherds that graze, they're in more of a desert style of area. So there's only certain patches of grass that's green pasture that a shepherd has to lead the sheep to. Fortunately, the shepherd, knowing a whole lot more than the sheep, is able to guide and lead those sheep to the places where they need to gra graze in the middle of the desert. Small oases that are out there with a little bit of a spring and maybe a few palm trees. And after sheep lie down, after they graze and eat, they lie down in those green pastures to sleep. Also, besides food, what do we need? We need water. We need liquids to nourish us. And David said, he leads me beside quiet waters. Folks, you know what's so interesting is sheep are very fearful animals. They will not drink from a running stream or a running brook because they fear the sound of the water. They'll only drink from a quiet stream where the water is not moving. So the shepherd would need to, lie, to lead them to quiet waters where they could drink freely. I remember the sheep on my grandparents' farm would always drink from a big tub of water that my grandfather would fill up for them. And when they were thirsty, they'd go over there to drink from that water. And what was so interesting is that my grandmother basically took, after they sheared the sheep and washed the wool, she made a handmade quilt for every single one of her grandchildren, stuffed with that wool that was grown right on my grandparents' farm. And each grandchild received one of them. There were several grandchildren. I don't know how many all together, but I'm sure it was like 10 or 12. And each received their own quilt stuffed with the wool grown on my grandparents' farms. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He provides food. He provides water, clothing, everything we need. And then David says in verse 3, He restores my soul. Folks, one of the main works that God is doing in us is the restoration of our soul. Back in the book of Genesis, it says that man was made in the image of God. God said, let us, notice the plural, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So we are actually made in the image of God. Well, when Adam and Eve gave in to temptation, when they sinned in the garden and, and accepted the serpent's temptation of eating the forbidden fruit, they were driven out of the garden and caused a sinful nature to be in mankind. And Adam and Eve passed on that sinful nature to Cain and Abel. And sadly, Cain became a murderer and killed his brother Abel out in the field because of that sinful nature. What God is doing now in the work of restoration of our souls and restoring our soul 
is changing us back from our sinful natural selves and in the very image of God. That's what being Christ-like is, being in the image of God. And God loves us too much. He loves us exactly the way we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay the way we are. And that's why he works through the circumstances of life, through trials and tribulations, through the aging process, to work in us a restoration of our soul to make us be like Jesus Christ and walk in the image of the new man. We're given a new birth at the time we receive Christ as Savior. We have the Holy Spirit come to indwell us and guide us. And God wants us to grow up in Christ and Christ be formed in each one of us so we're different. And David realized that God was restoring his soul. Praise God, we're not the people that we once were. We're a changed people. We're a new people, zealous of good works, as Peter says. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. Look at the next clause there. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Sheep don't know where to go to find the best pasture. Sheep don't know where to go to find a quiet water. But the shepherd knows, and God wants to lead us in paths of righteousness. Sadly, sometimes we stray, we go our own way, and what happens? We find bitterness. We find that our way doesn't work, and we need to come back to the shepherd. It says he leads us in paths of righteousness, the right way to go. God is a God of guidance. I remember so well when Solomon was coronated and given the kingship, God said, ask me anything you want, and I'll give it to you. Solomon looked around and said, Lord, I'm young. I don't know which way to go. I pray you would give me wisdom. And God said, Solomon, I'll give you all the wisdom you need. And besides that, I'll also give you riches, which you didn't ask for. And Solomon had the wisdom to run the whole nation of Israel and write many of the book of Proverbs that we have today in the 31 chapters of the book of Proverbs. He guides me in paths of righteousness. If you need guidance on an issue, take it to God in prayer. You don't know what to do in a financial situation or purchasing a home or something, take it to the Lord in prayer. God can guide you and lead you in paths of righteousness. Now verse four is perhaps one of the heaviest verses in scripture, one of the most important. Let's read it together. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Folks, one thing you and I are going to have to pass through one day is our own physical death. The book of Hebrews says it's appointed unto every man once to die, and after that, the judgment. All of us one day are going to have to die. I love that little verse tucked away in Corinthians. It says, though our outer man is perishing, we're growing older, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day after the image of the one who created him. So God is restoring our soul while we're doing this, and we're going to have to one day walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know how hard it is to lose the people you love. You know how hard it is to see them pass away. But you and I are going to have to walk through that very valley of the shadow of death, a very dark valley to go through. But look what David says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you, Lord, are with me. Folks, we can be fully assured that when the day of our death comes, there is nothing to be afraid of. We're going to be ushered into the very presence of God. It's interesting, over in the New Testament, Jesus tells the story about the rich man and Lazarus. Now, this is a different Lazarus from the one that Jesus raised from the dead, who was the brother of Mary and Martha. This was a different beggar named Lazarus who was laid at the gates of a rich man's home. And while the rich man had a good, full, sumptuous life, uh, Lazarus basically had to eat the crumbs that fell from his table. And then Jesus says, Lazarus died 
and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Folks, when it's your time to pass away, when it's my time to die, we can be assured that God will be right there with angels that will carry us very right into the presence to be with God. And we can say like Paul, absent from the body, present with the Lord. God practices, promises, and guarantees that he'll be there at the moment of our death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And then he mentions two important things in that last clause. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Every shepherd back in biblical times, and even to this day, would carry two instruments. One was a rod, and one was a staff. If you think about the rod, the rod was real heavy at one end, and slowly sloped down to a smaller bottom part. It was shaped somewhat like a baseball bat. And some of these rods back in biblical times were even iron tipped to make them heavy. They were basically a defensive weapon. If a wolf or a bear or perhaps a lion came out to try to attack the flock, the shepherd could take his rod and hold the smaller end and have like a bat to fight against that animal, against that predator, it was trying to steal one of the sheep. And if you actually go back to the life of David when he was but a young boy and went up against Goliath, he told King Saul, look, a lion one time came after the sheep, and I killed a lion. Another time a bear came after the sheep, and I killed a bear. So David had the confidence by killing a lion and a bear that he could take out Goliath just using his sling. But the rod the shepherd had there to try to beat off predators, to beat off a wolf that was coming after a sheep. And being heavy with that iron put onto the end of the rod, that was a very, very heavy weapon that he could use to drive that predator away. The shepherd also had a staff. And we know the staff would come up and be shaped somewhat like a hook. He could use that to pull a sheep back into the, into the pen if he was trying to get out. Or if a sheep fell into a ravine, he could reach down with that hook and pull that sheep out. I remember my mom and dad when I was young talking about a show called Vaudeville. And this was before TV, it was just radio and things like that, but they would show some of the old episodes and things like that that they had filmed on TV. And if somebody came out to sing and they couldn't sing very well in a Vaudeville act, this big old cane would come out from behind the stage and grab that person and slowly pull them off the stage. That could be used for something like that. So a shepherd had a rod to beat off the predators and a staff to help capture sheep and everything like that. And you know one thing else I learned as I was studying and preparing? Sometimes if a shepherd had a sheep that was especially rebellious, he would run off more times than he should and he was causing the shepherd a lot of trouble and a lot of time. The shepherd would actually take that animal and break one of its legs. Sounds painful, doesn't it? Chastening out of love. But then he would lift that sheep up and carry it over his shoulders until the, sh the, the leg of that sheep would heal and mend. And then after a period of time, perhaps weeks, perhaps a month or two, after that sheep's leg had healed, the shepherd would take that sheep off of his shoulders and put it down and that sheep would never leave the side of the shepherd. I've heard one time that God cannot use a person greatly until he has hurt that person deeply. And Charles Spurgeon in his preaching said of preachers, God cannot use a man um, in a great way until he's hurt that man deeply. So often that pain will teach us our need of God and the need of staying close to the shepherd. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. I can take comfort knowing God is going to protect me. You can take comfort in what situation you find yourself in, knowing that God will comfort you. God is going to protect you and watch over you. You know, I remember a time, too, when I was young, and my mom and dad would take my sister and I to Clearwater Beach. Mama would fry chicken up and then she'd wrap it in aluminum foil and put it in the cooler and we'd have soft drinks and potato chips and we would have that for our lunch. That good old cold fried chicken tasted so good after you'd been swimming in salt water. 
And I remember one time being out there and playing with dad in the water. And dad would put his hands like this, and us little kids would put our foot in there. And dad would throw us way up into the air, and we'd splash down in the water. And we had a big time. And dad would play a long time throwing my sister and I up into the water like that. We just thought that was the funniest thing. But I remember one time a big old wave coming in. And all of a sudden that wave knocked me clean off my feet. And I was spinning in the water. And all I could see was water and, and white foam and things like that. And all of a sudden, boom, I come out up the water. My dad had grabbed me by the wrist and was holding me like this and says, Are you okay, boy? I said, yeah, Dad, I'm okay, wiping the water out of my eyes, and he sat me back down. He was right there protecting me, just like God will protect us through different things we go through. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, David shifts here at verse 5 from talking about being a shepherd and shows that God is also a very gracious host. You know, when you invite somebody over your home for dinner, you prepare your house for dinner, you prepare the table. You usually put down a nice tablecloth. You'll have plates and forks put there with napkins and a glass for the drink of iced tea, whatever you happen to be serving at the time. And you'll prepare a table. And look what David says in verse 5. He said, Lord, you prepare a table before me in the very presence of my enemies. You know, it's interesting, folks, when you look at the nation of Israel back in Old Testament times and even up through present day, all of Israel's enemies are all around here. You have the Syrians and the Aramaeans to the north. You have the Babylonians out here to the east of Israel. Down on the southeast, you had Moab and Ammon, two people, the Moabites and Ammonites that were against Israel. On the far southeast, you had Egypt, that often did raids into Israel. And along the coast, you had the Phoenicians, who were the predecessors of the Philistines. And the Philistines were the enemies of Israel all throughout history. In fact, Goliath was a Philistine warrior. So here in the presence of his enemies, with his enemies all around him, David says, you prepare a table before me right in the presence of my enemies. David knew he could sit down and enjoy a meal because God was protecting him on all sides. 360 degree protection by the hand of God. Then he says, you anoint my head with oil. Back, it was an ancient custom back in those times in the ancient Near East, that if a guest came to visit you, he had to travel by foot by a long way or perhaps ride a donkey. But with the hot Mideastern sun beating down upon him, you would take a cloth and wipe his head and put some oil on his head to treat the skin. You see, it was a perfumed oil, and you would treat a guest special when he came into your house. David says, you anoint my head with oil. I can again remember getting sunburned at the beach, and when we got home and our backs were red and things like that, Mama would bring out a little white bottle called solar cane. I don't know whether they still sell that today in stores or not. But that solar cane was so comforted on that sunburned skin. And Mama would put that on my sister and my backs to help us not feel that heat from the sunburn. And that stuff worked really good. She also kept a little aloe plants to help with burns and things like that. She was a nurse. She, she knew what to do to treat different ailments like that. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, protection. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. God keeps filling up the cup and it overflows. You ever take a glass with some ice and you pour a carbonated beverage over it and you pour in too much and it overflows the cup? You got to grab a dish towel or a, or a rag or something and wipe that extra up. David talks about his cup overflowing. God's given him more than he needs to drink besides anointing his head with oil and preparing that table for me. And then he wraps up Psalm 23 with these words. Surely goodness and mercy, or goodness and love, as the NIV translates that word, will follow me. That word love is the Hebrew word chesed. And chesed means God's covenant royal love that he made with the nation of Israel when he entered into a covenant with them by giving them his law through Moses, the Mosaic covenant. Goodness and mercy, goodness and love will follow me. How often? All the days of my life. 
Every single day you can count on God's presence. Every single day you can count on God's protection. Every single day you can know the Lord is watching over you. And remember what Jesus told the disciples when he went to go away? I will never leave you or forsake me. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, Lord, are with me. Soak his presence in, and you know he's always with you at that time. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and then the promise, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Notice again, all capitals on Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God will usher us into his presence at death, absent from the body, present with the Lord. One day we receive a brand new resurrected body. We go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, another beautiful imagery of having a covenant meal with God, being with Jesus for all eternity, and we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So folks, realize God is your good shepherd. God will faithfully lead you and guide you. God will protect you. God will provide food and water. I read earlier this week where one of the patriarchs back in Genesis said, I serve the God who has fed me from my youth. He knew God had always provided for him. I'll close with this. Uh, years ago at a Christian conference, there was a very famous orator who was going to speak. He was right around 35 to 40 years old, and he had a really excellent voice. He was trained in speaking and public speaking and those type of things and orations. And he was asked to get up and do a rendition of the 23rd Psalm. So he got up and he read, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. All the way through the Psalm. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And the people gave him a strong ovation and clapped for his rendition of the 23rd Psalm. After that, they had an old retired minister who came up who was in his low 80s, 82, 83 years old. And they asked him if he would read the 23rd Psalm. And he started out with a broken voice and crackling, his voice being used years in the ministry. And he read, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want all the way through the psalm and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and the people gave him a standing ovation after he had sat down the younger speaker came up and said folks I want you to realize what you just witnessed I know the 23rd psalm this older brother here knows the shepherd Get to know the shepherd. He wants all of you to protect you, to guide you, to lead you, to provide for you, and give you the best life you could possibly have. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 10? I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I think God wants so much more for us than we're willing to step into. Step out in faith. Remember, Hebrews says God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Get to know the shepherd, and I guarantee you'll find green pastures. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the richness of Psalm 23, how you've used it for over 2,000 years to minister to people, and even longer than that, back in the history of Israel, those that knew you as Savior. Thank you for its richness, its wealth, and thank you for your ever-abiding presence. Help us not to take you lightly, Lord, but realize you're always there, and we can always call out to you in time of need. Thank you, Father, for the richness of Psalm 23, and more importantly, the richness of you, our Shepherd King. In Christ's name, amen. Folks, thank you so much for being with us. I hope this psalm and taking a fresh look at Psalm 23 has encouraged you in your faith. Get along with God this week. Remember to use your upper room or your daily bread, whatever kind of devotional aids you need, to build your own personal relationship 
with God. It's one thing to know about God. It's a whole different thing to know God. Get to know him, and I guarantee you'll find a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Amen. I look forward to seeing you next week, the month of November. And remember, next Sunday, the first Sunday in November, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. So make sure you have a small piece of bread and a little portion of grape juice so you can celebrate the Lord's Supper with us when we have that at the end of our message. Thank you again for tuning in, and I wish you the best as we walk and step into the brand new month of November 2022. Thank you.